Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. Like everybody else, I watched the Peloton holiday ad and I'm just gonna put this out there. If your significant other gives you a Peloton for Christmas, it's not because they want you to vlog and make content for your channel. All right, let's start with some hot takes or really just things we find funny on the internet and don't wanna cancel. Have you ever had a gratin croquette burger? What? Well, it's basically fried carbs with a hint of shrimp on a stick, but it's also a McDonald's holiday favorite in Japan. I mean, look at this ad and tell me your heart doesn't just melt from the wholesomeness. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot better than what I see at a McDonald's here in the States. Well, you guys have no Szechuan sauce? No. I want Szechuan sauce. Where's my Szechuan sauce? Congratulations to Carmelo Anthony for winning the NBA's Player of the Week award in the same week Luka Doncic beat the Lakers and James Harden scored 60 and three quarters. Look, anything we have to do to make Melo feel comfortable and wanted, right? Let's all keep this same energy for the inevitable day when Draymond Green goes Paul Pierce on him. They don't love you like that, Melo. You ain't Braun. You ain't D-Wade. Darko got more love than you. I can hear it now. Prada and Dior are quickly becoming the sneaker equivalent of a succession rivalry, meaning it's petty, it's super rich, and no one can relate to it. This week, both revealed their expensive collaborations with Adidas and Jordan brand respectively, and the reaction online was basically everybody starting a GoFundMe to afford these. So let me get this straight. I can either spend over three grand for an Italian leather superstar and a bag your uncle might mistake for his bowling night gear, or two grand for a Jordan 1 New York to Paris with a swoosh that looks like a rough draft of a Dapper Dan piece back in the 1980s. These things better come with the Peloton bike. The crazy thing is these will both sell out quick because if people are paying thousands for ones at resale, they'll also pay thousands for a first of its kind collaboration. It's like the Union Ones if they were succession levels of pretentious and not just dudes who would show up at the Rose Bowl flea market with their collab as a troll. But there is a silver lining though. If this is all leading up to Gucci teaming with Under Armour and kids have to line up to cop Chef Curry's and Gucci colors, I guess the hype these tears will be all worth it. It will, it will. Iconic, and I mean that in the same way people call Yeezys that came out last month iconic. Reality TV show Jersey Shore debuted 10 years ago this week. Considering all of the crazy antics these walking spray tans got involved in, it's a miracle that tax evasion is maybe the most criminal thing any of them ever got caught up in. But props to them for mostly sticking together after all these years because I can't even get my writing staff to watch my videos if they're not involved. Way to support the cause, team. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. All right, hotter take. Airship or air sh so uh, this past week, the Prince Estate dropped a reissue of 1999 in the form of a massive six disc box set that features alternate takes of classic songs, live recordings, and some tracks that have only been heard in bootleg form until today. One of those songs is Purple Music, a track that Rolling Stone calls one of the most claustrophobic and repetitive songs Prince has ever made. While hearing a new Prince song is always a cause for celebration, there's probably a reason why the legendary artist didn't want Purple Music to be on 1999 or even on the B side of a single. By the way, I realize that some of the people watching this have no idea what a box set or a B side is. Don't mind us boomers, kids. We're getting to the point. Give a second. This past week, Fragment Design's Hiroshi Fujiwara gave us a first look at what looks like a proper retro of the Nike Air ship, the shoe that Michael Jordan wore in the NBA prior to the Air Jordan 1. As some people know, the Air ship is the shoe that caused the NBA to fine MJ because it violated their uniform code at the time. So by the time Nike dropped their memorable band commercial, Nike had MJ switch over to the Air Jordan 1 and the rest is history. By the way, if you wanna see how far we've come, there was a time when a black and red sneaker was considered inappropriate for a team that uses black and red as their primary colors. Now PJ Tucker wears Kobe exclusive purple and gold Hirachis while playing for the Houston Rockets and nobody says a thing. Cause they're cool. Go figure. For all the hype the airship gets from a very vocal faction of sneaker historians and MJ fans, it is still at the end of the day, a deep cut. It's a shoe that most sneakerheads have forgotten and casual fans have never even heard of. But now that it's getting a big rollout in the form of a 
a sneaker pack that also includes a long lost Air Jordan 1 PE in white and red, which if we're being honest, would probably sit in stores unless the right celebrity wore it out in public. Whenever Nike decides to drop this Airship slash Jordan pack, it's going to do huge numbers because of the hype surrounding it. You know every old sneakerhead and hype beast is going to tell you this is a must have item. Me personally, I'm glad Nike held out as long as they did, but not because I believe this is a retro that had to be done right. You could say this is a hard pass, but honestly, I'm just not a huge fan of the Airships. I'm sure there's an argument being made that the Airship is not that much different than the Air Jordan 1, but that's like someone showing you the pointing Spider-Man meme, and one of them is from 2099. We're missing the point here. What the pack and seeing the shoes side by side did was highlight for me their differences. From the color blocking, to the Wings logo, to the collar, not to mention the history that would be made wearing them, the Air Jordan 1 was the shoe that launched Michael Jordan and Nike to new heights, while the Airship looked like a wear test sample that players wear during practice. I know it sounds like I'm being disrespectful to the Airship and the way it looks, like those Nike boxing shoes Rocky wore way before Kobe Bryant thought about going high, but from an aesthetic standpoint, I just don't see what the OGs see. I mean, nobody cares that LeBron James wore the Zoom Flight 2K3 when he was in Summer League. Nobody is asking for a retro of Adidas Top 10 2000s that Kobe Bryant wore when he was a rookie, but we're being told that the ships are important and that you are not a true sneakerhead if you don't appreciate the history and cop a pair. True, neither shoe was banned by the NBA, although, side note, the NBA should have done something about those Kobe 2s that look like submarines, but that's a different thing here. My view is that the airships are the purple music of sneakers, a worthwhile artifact from a time we all miss, but something that needs to stay in that time. Look, I'm happy for all of the fans who have been waiting for the ship to finally arrive in stores, but I just don't think it is a shoe that the public is going to want. As a collector and a guy that works in sneakers, yes, I know the shoe is relevant and it has a story to tell, and for that reason, I want a pair. However, as a regular consumer, I just don't see many people breaking these out and rocking them on the regular. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. <laughs> All right, it's time for the heat check that still needs an intro song. Somebody out there make an intro song for us. Uh, we've got a strong week of sneaker releases, including the annual Air Jordan 11 drop that everybody and their grandma is waiting for. No, really, your grandma needs those 11s to match her Supreme fit. I've seen them in the malls these days, people. Hypebeast grandmas are no joke at all. Let's start with December 9th, the Nike SB and Air Jordan 1 Desert Ore. The next Nike SB Jordan release features a khaki upper that you can rip apart to reveal mismatching you and royal blue colorways. Looking forward to hitting the skate park in these and have people asking if I'm Tony Hawk or something. Really? Yeah, kind of. Uh, December 9th, the Nike Dunk Biotech. Uh, what was once a regional exclusive from the early 2000s is coming back and looking to kill the resale prices of the 2013 retro that nobody really liked until Virgil Abloh wore them last year. Just saying. December 11th, the Batman times Chinatown Market Converse Chuck 70. There's a very long-winded connection here with Jack Nicholson playing the legendary Batman villain Joker while also starring in a movie called Chinatown in the 70s, but I won't get into it. I'm really just here for some dope Batman sneakers, and you should too. December 14th, the Adidas Yeezy Boost 350 V2 Yeez Reel. I'm just glad we got our mind out of the gutter and didn't call these semi-frozen yellow V2, if you know Gross. what I mean. And for our pick of the week, it's the Air Jordan 11 Bread, or playoffs, depending on who you are. Whether you are trying to get your first pair or doubling or tripling up because your last retro was starting to get that old wash feeling, no sneaker captures the imagination and the attention of every boomer in the country who long to be cool again, quite like an Air Jordan 11 drop in an OG colorway. The shoe returns with a higher patent leather cut, which is closer to the original, but it won't have the 45 on the back uh, like the last year's Concord Retro. <laughs> All right, let's move on to hard pass, my favorite part of the show where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go, like Dwight Howard shooting threes. Look, man, Dwight's been great so far this season as a role player. For his sake and my sanity, I hope this isn't some sort of attempt for Dwight to start acting like Dwight again. Where's Stan Van Gundy with his Diet Pepsi when you need him to calm you down? All right, so this week Hard Pass, it's gonna dive into some topics and themes that we should warn you ahead of time are a little more mature and for mature audiences. So if you're not comfortable with conversations about sexual assault, then maybe skip to the end of this video. So. 
Despite the toxic nature regarding every Saturday drop and the occasional heated moment on social media, the sneaker community is a very tight knit one, especially those that work in the media slash influencer space. You do this job long enough and you begin to see a lot of the same names and faces popping up at different events. And in time, you develop friendships, whether that's someone working for another outlet and in public relations or even designers and athletes. Sometimes those relationships are online, other times they become something deeper and more genuine. Basically, if you're in this small world, everybody knows everybody. I might not know LeBron on a personal level, but I bet I know somebody that knows somebody who knows somebody if I really needed to reach out. Sneakers not only felt like a cool space to work in, but it felt safe. However, recently one of our own posted a disturbing account of sexual assault on her Tumblr, detailing her anguish over a relationship that once felt like a dream, but grew to be twisted, unhealthy, and far from safe. Allegedly, the abuser, whom we also know, took pictures of her while she showered without her knowledge and consent and shared them with someone else. I hate to have to spell this out, but this is never okay. This is revenge porn and that is illegal in both civil and criminal law. She would go on to share other stories about the deterioration of their relationship and how that would play out sometimes even in public settings. It took a lot of courage and strength for her to speak out and to put this out there, but she also acknowledged that it wasn't easy because of the way he had presented himself as somebody who champions women in the sneaker world and the importance of inclusion. She says, how could I come forward and speak out against someone in the community we're both a part of? The same industry where many friends praise and admire his work. She then goes on to say that after she was threatened by him, she spoke to a lawyer and filed a domestic violence restraining order against him. While I have not been in a similar situation, I can empathize with her because it's crushing when something or someone you believe in can in time shock and disappoint and use that belief against you even when you finally confront them about it. In the post, she did not name her abuser. So out of respect, we will not name him and we ask that you not include his name in the comments below. He was already a controversial figure prior to all of this. So so after these allegations came to pass, the judgment was swift and the wave to cancel him was strong. I'm glad that in times like this, we choose to rally and believe in her. But what happens when the accused is someone we know and like and care about? This walled garden that we thought we lived in is no longer the case. And it's more than likely that others will tell their stories of harassment and abuse. Will the desire to call them out on social media be as strong or will the Twitter fingers calm down? As she says in her post, it's always F abusers until someone close to you is the abuser. Then you get real quiet and want to turn a blind eye. Are we only choosing her side because it's convenient since the knives were already out for him? Or are we doing so because we actually believe her and have a genuine desire to keep our little side of the world safe as much as possible? I feel like this is only the beginning of something that the sneaker community has to reconcile. And it is my hope we support and believe. This shouldn't be about vendettas or grudges or how much we do or do not like someone. It should be about doing the right thing. And so far, I believe that we as a sneaker community are doing just that. And finally, if you or anyone you know is currently in an abusive relationship, know that there are resources to help you get through this as difficult as it may be. Call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or consult with friends, family, people you trust, or a lawyer. The most important thing to remember is that you are not alone and this is not something you have to go through alone. All right, I know it was a little dark, but I felt like it was something we needed to say here on the show, and that's gonna do it for our show today. I wanna to thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am Jacques Slade, and I will see you guys again next week for another episode. Peace.